Hey, man, how's it going? It's going good. How are you? All right. Let's talk about uh, some iOS updates to start out with this week. We've got iOS 13.7 and iOS 14 beta 7. So starting out with iOS 13.7, what is new in this really high version number that we're seeing in <laughs> September? Yeah, the whole uh, the whole COVID thing has kind of shot the, the version numbers up this year. Like for a while, it was everyone was talking about the um, you know the the bugginess of iOS 13. That was obviously the big 2019 story, and how Apple was you know pumping out updates, having like the point one a week after they did point zero. But then the numbers have uh, now shot up to point seven, which I believe is a record for like the minor number. Um, I think the previous we got to was point five, but two of those updates are just adding uh, like the exposure notification stuff, right? So you can, uh, you know, a couple of the earlier updates were representative of just you know fixing bugs, but a lot of the, st- the the we we if if it wasn't for the pandemic, we wouldn't have crossed and made a record minor number if you see what i mean so because i see some people like look how high are many versions of iOS 13 people have to put out because it was so bad whose so, who's voice is that uh, that is my like generic <laughs> twitter complainer voice is that is that how you read twitter yeah <laughs> people who the, <laughs> the, the more intelligent comments get a different voice but that is okay the, okay that is they're, the, they're your that voice is the, the crowd think and yeah. uh, um, but what is coming 30.7 is the deployment of the promised phase two thing. And Apple is branding this as Exposure Notification Express. And basically, it's uh, building the ability to get uh, COVID proximity alerts directly into the setup process of the phone. So you don't need to download a third-party app. You can just update your your iPhone, and it will ask you on setup, do you want to enable COVID notification, uh, exposure notifications? Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't just work. You still have it, Apple still has to partner with like the local health authorities but they've actually made it simpler for the local health authorities to get on board so uh like a a state doesn't have to make an app if they don't want to apple says they're going to continue to support the people who have you know gone out of the way to make the whole whole app and obviously then you can get some additional functionality by opening the app itself uh but baseline notifications now can be done just through this like express version and And this this is what they called phase two when they were right back in March and April when they had, I guess it was mostly April when they had their um, two-phase plan between Apple and Google to develop the API for contact tracing, that the fastest way to do it is support the API in in the Android and iOS, and then given more time, they could develop this feature. And I imagine there's also a corresponding Android update yes. to 13.7. Is that right. available as well? Uh, yes, uh, it's, it goes through Google Play services, but Google Play services, well. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Because nice. I think when they were planning this back in March time, they were probably optimistically looking for higher adoption because they were like, <laughs> yeah. "We're going to do the phase one first to get it out there, so everyone can adopt the API, and then we'll do ours down the road." But I briefly, I briefly remember them saying something about um, at least uh, in each region, greater than fifty percent adoption for for, <laughs> to, for for it to be effective. For know? it to be effective, right? And yeah. They certainly haven't got fifty percent of regions even offering it at the moment. No. Like, it, the, co- the phase two uh, has arrived, and they've got what like a smattering of countries and a few states on board with the previous model. So hopefully, the express version will actually speed the process up. They did a press release uh, that was really uh, uh, like, like if you didn't if you didn't follow this stuff, then you think mm-hmm. it was pretty like it was pretty positive. Um, I think from our perspective that the lack of support from different uh, states and countries is concerning, um, considering that it's, that it's, you know, created, uh, that it's, it, it's, it, you know, the technology companies made this stuff. Um, but if you read that press release, then you'd think like, you know, well, they're doing pretty good. <laughs> and it's just kind of that, spin. I mean, that's their job as PR, I guess, is to put that spin on it. And, um, all right. But, you know, it was really one of those press releases that made me think, oh, man, this is not quite the reality you know even if the numbers are true it was a lot of uh interest and stuff like that but if you look at it and say well really there's like you know a handful of states out of 50 um that are participating it's not not there yet yeah so on the on the old framework version obviously the like a local health government would have to uh, hire a massive team of developers and server engineers and they'd have to work together to make the application not just for ios but also for android obviously uh, that's all been streamlined now with the express version. Basically, the governments only have to 
write a config file that says like their name and the logo and then what criteria applies to trigger notification because in different states or different countries the local health guidance uh, varies a bit so what should trigger an exposure notification alert uh, is different in different places so mm -hmm. you know apple and google are trying to be pretty flexible and saying look we can detect these you know 10 different criteria tell us which ones apply to your area and then we can send out the notifications in, in that way and then in that config file it'll, they can also just write like the message they want to show when an uh, exposure alert is detected so it should it, it means they don't have to hire like you know 10 developers to make an app which is part of the reason it's taken so long for these places for the for the for the states that want to do it it's just taken months because you know it requires engineering work and testing and etc so this is much closer to the metal and much easier for them to get on board it's like filling out a form on a website versus like building the website if that makes sense so does this mean that tracking state apps is less valuable or you know is it, there's still a state by state I guess adoption to be tracked, whether it's phase one or phase two, whether it's having a dedicated app or supporting the OS feature. Yeah, I, th I think it's basically the same. Like the you still you're still gonna need the app to report yourself as COVID nineteen mm -hmm. positive. So that's the difference. And that's um, a, that's changed since the beginning. That correct. That was the plan. Yeah. Yeah, but at least for notification delivery, that can be done on a phase two approach, which is probably better mm -hmm. because then. You don't have to worry about going to the app store or anything. You'll just get presented, like users literally just get asked when they update to 13.7, do you want to enable COVID notifications if it's supported for your region? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you can get a push notification when the region comes on board. So if they if, if you update and it's not supported like in the UK at the moment, although they're hoping to still supposedly roll one out by the end of the year, you can get a notification for when it is there so you can turn it on. So you can be prompted to enable it. Yeah, and this was released just on September the first, so this is this is brand new this week. So, uh, it, and, yeah, because it was in beta, of... it it went to beta last week, right? And mm -hmm. when it first came out, people were like, uh, "Well, you know, I I assumed and stuff that oh, this because iOS fourteen is going to be late, and so they they're having to roll it into the like a thirteen point seven version rather than fourteen point oh. But they clearly uh, had no interest in waiting around because it got released within a week. So that explains why you know, like Mark Gurman and others have been saying that oh no, don't worry iOS 14 is still coming in September and it's just going to launch way earlier than the phones will because the phones are coming like mid-October and they'll launch with like 14.1 but apparently iOS 14.0 is coming out sometime in September so that'll be interesting because it's going to be before the, the iPhone event whereas normally Apple announces the release date for the major operating system alongside the announcement of the phones, right? Hmm. Yeah. I was looking for... Um, they when they When they did the... Uh, I guess there was kind of an announcement about this. They they did share some numbers about like kind of how the experience has gone so far. There's like a greater than zero number of people who have benefited possibly well, that... from <laughs> from 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 you know what's been out there. I, I can't find it in front of me there right now, but I was, I was that's something I was curious about. Was you know I, I wonder if anyone actually has benefited from what they've what they've been able to deploy so far it was just because of their. Um, you know, hesitation from states and, and then roadblocks to, to put this out there. But, yeah. yeah, I think they said that uh, 25 states and territories in the US uh, are exploring exposure notification systems, which represents more than half of the population. But exploring versus committed and doing it is very different things. As, as we've seen so far, yes. Um, and then in iOS 14 beta 7 that's out today, there's also watchOS 7 beta 7 from yesterday. And macOS Big Sur beta six from today. Um, the, the big thing that I've seen so far is the is new wallpapers. Sort of um, the six color, like apple color rainbow wallpapers in iOS fourteen. They now have a dark mode version where <laughs> there's always been a, a, a black background version with the six color stripes across. Plus, there were versions with colors as the background, uh, and now. I guess by I guess they just happen to they, they they all do this now that if you're in dark mode then they then they all go black. Yeah, so the the light mode version now is like a color flash. It's so the old it's the old version. Yeah, and now the 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 dark the the background goes true black and you just get the stripes going across the middle. So for a while Apple had like the still wallpapers uh like the stock ones which did have the 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 different versions for light and dark mode, but then below you just have the general wallpapers. And so it's, someone decided, you know what, we can do a dark mode version of the stripes as well. So now you've got black version, you've got black background version of, of the like five color stripes or the six color stripes. 
the the earth and flower wallpapers continue are just unchanged below so they're still just like straight photographs if you don't want something that changes yeah so so the, they're more dynamic than ever at least <laughs> and, then, and the and actual what? the actual dynamic wallpapers continue to have no changes whatsoever yeah um uh, and then and then uh and macOS big Sur beta 6 so i was happy to see that out because um i i, I love macOS big Sur and i can't wait for it to be stable and it's not there yet um, at least in my configuration with having uh, a, a laptop that I put into clamshell mode, you know, close the lid, connected to a mouse and keyboard and a couple of displays. And um, I, I still have that experience where it's like a time bomb of when it's going to reboot if, if I do that. Um, and so luckily everything's pretty good, like autosave these days. I was even in GarageBand doing some audio stuff. And uh, I was like, oh, no, I lost all that work, but it, was, it autosaved. But um, I'm, it's at the point now, like we're getting closer. I guess I guess macOS updates tend to be like later anyway. Um, yeah, they don't October. have to be day and date. Yeah, but um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that at least beta version this it's gets more stable. Otherwise, I'm right now. I'm considering that my 16 inch MacBook Pro is like the whatever version we're on that's not Big Sarah. Was it Catalina? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that's that's the version that I, I keep this on for a while. So. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's still beta season, right? We got to see how it. Yeah, it's still beta season. Again. When they find it's GM. The one other thing yeah. I want to mention from I was 14 beta 7 is the app library seen a few changes. So they oh, have, really? yeah. So you know, like before, the categorization was really weird because it was basically just ripping yes. the app store categories. And uh, now they've changed the categorization a bit. Uh, obviously, this beta has only just come out, so having a full chance to like analyze if it's actually different or just the names are different. But it seems slightly more sane because like before. They, they've got a few new groupings now, like information and reading and then productivity and finance. Like they have a bit more grouping that, than just like what the app store categories are. So it seems like they made it a bit more intelligent. I'll be honest, I haven't used the app library since beta one just because I never saw a need for it really and how I use the phone. So I can't remember exactly what was different from before. But the way I look at it now and then the labels are definitely different. So And it did seem to make a little bit more sense to me when I was just looking at the categories that are there on, on my phone. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, my homepage is the same as like I guess the first week I started using iOS fourteen. It's just that yeah. I got my my home screen, you know, with two widgets and eight icons in the dock, and then uh, app library. Uh, so social utilities, productivity and finance, creativity, entertainment, travel, information and reading. I think that might have been truncated before. Now it's like small text, so it's not truncated anymore. Right, okay. it's a, a sign of good progress. Um, shopping and food, health and fitness. Which my dog track is still there, and uh, other test flight and education. I wonder why education is at the very bottom of all of all those things. Yeah, that's the you problem mean, with this thing. Like, if you just want something slightly different, you can't change it. Like, maybe you could, is it when, is it like by use? <laughs> I don't know. Like, my social apps are always near the top, and I my yeah, mine's always like social utilities than games. So, like, and I don't play a lot. I don't play a lot of games. Play like one or two maybe. I have Fortnite downloaded at the moment just to track the continuing progress of the, <laughs> of the big debacle. But um, yeah, so that's the pro- that's the, my problem with the app library is that it's there for people that don't want to organize their apps, but you kind of need, I, I find I need at least a little bit of organization so I can put something where I want. I don't want stuff to fly around. And then what if the suggestions change and for some reason, you know, this app needs to be here. Like I, I feel like the old approach of just having you know, your, your first page home screen of icons and then like a second page is full of folders where the folders are arranged to your liking. That suits a lot of people better, including me. And then, I mean, the app library will get used because there's plenty of people in the world who have no time to organize the home screen at all. So they'll just have I think it's so good. That's, I, I forgot if I told you, probably, probably privately not on the show, but my uh, seven-year-old daughter, Emily, she saw my phone and she wanted, she said, I want my phone to look like that. Because what she saw was not like widgets or anything. It was app library and she wanted right. big folders. It's like okay, it's iOS fourteen is pretty good now. I'll put it on your phone. It'd be and, interesting uh, to see how many people like adopt it and use it versus people who like think they've deleted an app or but actually it's just gone to the app library and they never find it again. Like and they just don't yeah. realize it's still on their phone. Like it will too. It will take some training for people to understand the metaphors. Yeah. So the first thing I did was um like the app did the update and then I like hid her second and third home screens and she was happy. So. <laughs> Pretty cool. And then I started the widgets, and she was really happy about that. And there, the, the animations for like adding a widget is so nice. It's like the, really a throwback to um, when yeah, I first started using Max. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, the animations, on, Max. the animations on App Library and the widget stuff are really well done. Like they, mm-hmm. they've definitely polished them up. 
yeah, someone who appreciates charming animations made those. Uh, and then uh, this this mandatory permissions dialogue for tracking. Um, this is something about advertising. Facebook was very mad about it. Um, today, the information had an exclusive report saying that Apple was communicating to developers that they were going to delay this requirement in iOS 14. Uh, it's still there, but it won't be enforced until next year sometime. Um, and then <laughs> after the original re exclusive report from the information, um, uh, there, there was an embargo time at 1 p.m. Eastern time where uh, certain members of the press were informed about this, and then Apple published a, like a post about it as well. What does all of this mean? Yeah, so the this all relates to what's called the IDFA identifier, and it's basically the last stand that advertising frameworks or tracking frameworks have been able to use to identify a user between apps. So over time, Apple's slowly being rem removed the different ways that a, a, a user on one app can be re-identified if you download a separate application. And as of iOS 14, uh, Apple's now cracked down even harder by uh, they were going to require like a pop-up dialogue which said, do you want to let this app track you yet deny or allow? And if you pressed allow, you'd get the, you'd get, the app would get your IDFA number. Uh, and if you said deny, then it would, the app would just get garbage so it couldn't track you around. So in iOS 13, the IDFA is freely available unless you go into like settings and then like limit ad tracking. If you turn that on, it basically blanks out the IDFA with just like all zeros. So that's what that feature does. But what the change was in 14 is that Apple is actually making it very in your face by forcing a dialogue to show for every single application, just like you get a dialogue for location services, for instance, right? And so... The old, like, toggle, no one ever touched because it's buried in settings. Uh, but this toggle is right in your face, and the users have to explicitly say yes. So, you know, Facebook, all these ad SDKs, including, like, some ones that aren't just about advertising, just, like, ones that want to help track users around for, like, if if you buy some... If you follow, like, an ad on the web and you go and download an app from the App Store, if you don't allow this tracking, there's no way for them to retie up the advertising. Or if you, like, buy something on a website and you want to connect to the app, like... There, there are legitimate uses, but the primary use case is targeted advertising. Uh, and so all the advertisers were getting mad that Apple had like, flung these people on June, and by September, they weren't going to have a way to do it because they expect most people to just say, no, we don't want to be tracked, right? And Apple seems to have had conversations with these people and decided that they're going to take it slower. They still want to do it, but they're just delaying the timeline. So now the, uh, the feature will be in iOS 14, uh, but the dialogue won't be there until, you know, like March or whenever they decide to do it. And this is quite common. Like, I can f remember a few times when Apple's kind of announced like a new policy in June. And then before the first version actually ships, they talk with the developer community and the app community and be like, you know, we still want to do this, but we understand that you need more time to ad to adjust or you need... Uh, even even if there was like an alternative way to do it, it just takes resources and development time, and maybe Apple didn't appreciate that these companies wouldn't be ready, especially in the light of the pandemic stuff. Uh, you know, work processes have been disrupted, so there's some compassion there. And like, because I remember they uh, had all those rules for like kids apps that they were going to enforce like on the dot, and then that got delayed, and then they changed the rules slightly. And there's been other ones in the past too. This is just like the latest one of those. It's uh, I think it's understandable. Some people are saying that. You know, Apple's just like caving to Facebook because Facebook's really mad about it. But there is a wider story than just like what Facebook wanted. So I can understand it. Uh, if they if they drop the feature entirely, then you can say they've just like caved to the advertisers, which goes against their you know privacy first ideas. But they're just being practical and like, okay, we wanted to do this in September, but we realized that the rest of the community isn't and the ecosystem isn't ready to move along with us. So we're just going to push it back by a few months. That's the idea. Okay, not too bad. Yeah, it's fine. Like, ideally, they would announce it with a timeline in June and then stick to that timeline that was actually realistic rather than, like, announcing this stuff to ship immediately and then having to, you know, change it around. But there you go. Yeah, you, you, you can't uh, shoehorn everything into the one schedule that is mostly dominated by when the new iPhone comes out. Right, and especially in light <laughs> of, like, all this, uh, you know, antitrust stuff, uh, yeah. there's been a few companies complaining that, like, Apple just springs rules on us on a dime and we have to, you know, expend a lot of engineering resources and money to adopt and to uh, and react. Meanwhile, Apple's had 
internal foresight on this stuff for months and months and months and they can adjust you know at their own will basically they they these third parties complain that apple as well as with the monetary advantages apple gets it can update its apps internally like on its own schedule and then the third party community is always having to catch up to what apple announces so there are different there are different factors at play here but as long as they don't drop the policy completely because i think it was a good idea i don't have a problem with them just pushing the dates back a bit yeah, all right let's talk about our first sponsor this week sure smart investing means having a diversified portfolio a combination of stocks bonds mutual funds if you've ever looked at the details of the most successful portfolios though you usually find a diversified set of real estate real estate is not easily available to individual investors until now fundrise enables anyone to access these asset classes Fundrise makes it easy to build a portfolio of institutional quality real estate investments. Whether you're just starting out in the investing field or you're looking to grow, Fundrise has got you covered. It's an investing platform that can make investing in high quality real estate as simple as investing in the stock market. You can build a stable cash flow with a dividend based portfolio or look for long term growth with appreciation. Fundrise supports all pathways. Fundrise manages more than $1 billion in assets for 130,000 investors. Since 2014, the platform has averaged 8.7 to 12.4 percent annual returns. Investors have made in excess of 79 million dollars in dividends alone. Fundrise connects you with a team of real estate professionals that vet and manage all the investments. You can track your portfolio's performance through the easy-to-use Fundrise website. So you can start building your better portfolio today. Get started at fundrise.com/happyhour to have your first 90 days of advisory fees waived. That's f-u-n-d-r-i-s-e.com slash happy hour to get your first 90 days of advisory fees waived fundrise.com slash happy hour all right thanks fundrise so a uh, lot of new hardware <laughs> news this week uh in terms of rumors um and I, I think most of this comes from our friend mark german at bloomberg um first up is this ipad air that we talked about last week i guess it's ipad air 4 that, that we're talking about and yes. this this is the one that um is it's 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 kind of a whole new product in terms of like the design and everything. Um, it's taking the iPad Pro 2018 and 2020, um, you know, uh, full screen design and bringing that to a non Pro iPad for the first time um, and making some interesting choices like uh, not having Face ID but having Touch ID on the sleep wake button. So there's some really interesting things there about it. And then I think the most interesting thing is how much it will cost compared to an iPad Pro for what you get. Um, what's new with the iPad Air 4 this week? Yeah, so obviously last week we were basing our expectations off this kind of like semi-sketchy manual, right? Photos of a manual sure, different yeah. in French. And, there, you know, it looked decent. We couldn't see any evidence of Photoshopping or anything, but it is at the end of the day kind of this like, you know, unsourced, unprovenant manual. This week it seems to be confirmed by the fact that Bloomberg is saying that Apple is indeed readying an edge-to-edge -edge ipad for the full it's basically it's, it's it's cool to see because they're basically taking the best bits of the higher end line and bring it to a lower price point it's not going to be identical like i think some people were releasing these uh leaks schematics where the actual thickness of the bezels is going to be slightly thicker than what they are on the ipad pro and obviously you're going to have the touch id situation rather than face id although some people actually like like that because Face ID on the iPad is fine, but you do cover it up with your hands quite often, right? Like, there are ergonomic reasons why people like Touch ID, so they're going to bring Touch ID to the power button, supposedly, with the iPad Air 4, and that allows them to bring, you know, most of the industrial design of the big one to the lower-end model. The open question is whether they're going to do a magic keyboard for the iPad Air. Like, so, obviously, they have the smart connector already, which supports the smart keyboard folio, uh, but they only make the, you know, the floating cantilever design one at the moment for the iPad Pro models. Uh, will they make one for the iPad Air? It, nobody's said for sure. I expect they will because Apple likes money and those kind of accessories are very good profit makers. And they provide, you know, laptop style experiences. Yeah. It's also very expensive. <laughs> yeah, like, the, but, but, the, but like they, the iPad they, Air is what for, starts at 499 at the moment and the cases are like, those those, uh, those magic keyboard cases are like two seven nine just for the small one. Like the pricing yeah. definitely is working out. Yeah, but they they've at least priced the pro one so high that they have a lot of room to price the air ones high as well, without being <laughs> as much as the iPad itself. Yeah, I, 
you have the same awkwardness with like the 329 iPad where they also try and sure. sell you the smart keyboard folio for that as well. And that's also pretty expensive relative to the price of the actual tablet. So they're, they're not afraid to do that kind of stuff. Uh, presumably this uh, iPad Air will also support the second generation Magic Pencil, uh, Apple Pencil, because it's going to have USB-C instead of Lightning. So, and the new design, so it should ha oh, it should support charging the new pencil um, with the magnetic attachment on the side. Yep, uh, and then that's that's pretty much it for iPad. I mean, the big story there was that that it's gone from uh, in, in a brochure to in a major publication that's being reported is coming. Yeah, it went from uh, like sixty percent confidence, to like ninety percent confidence. So. Right. Yeah, even, or higher. Yeah. Um, iPhone 12. So there's been a lot of talk about the midnight green color that was introduced with the iPhone 12 Pro and, and, and 12 Pro Max. Um, that being a one-off for this this past year, and that some version of blue being the new color. Um, what's all the story there, and what else is new with iPhone 12 this week? Yeah. So basically, everyone now, including this Bloomberg report, is saying that uh, midnight green will be replaced by a dark blue option instead, like a deep blue or something. Which I'm all for, because I've never... We spoke about this in the show when Midnight Green was announced. Like, it, never, it didn't float my boat. Like, it just reminds me too much of, like, I don't know, war, or, like, army stuff. Like, it's not it's not my domain. Deep blue or a dark blue color, I'd be all for. Like, that... That's, all that, that, that's your domain. <laughs> yeah, blue. Yeah, give me a dark blue, and I'll be... I'll be... I, I like... My favorite colors on the iPhone have been the jet black one, for, which is iPhone 7, but that scratched so much that it was unpractical, but it looked cool. And then the matte black uh, iPhone, whatever one it was, I think it was iPhone 7 as well. They had Seven, the matte black. Yeah. yeah, they had the matte black one. I like the matte black. And then the slate blue color of the iPhone 5. That That's like yeah. the best colors. And this sounds like we're going to get some sort of return to that. You know, also, with slate, you also getting have... the iPhone 5 design because the, the sides are getting, you know, yeah. flattened. I hadn't thought about it much recently, but the, well, I hadn't thought about it in a long time, but with Slate, you also had an iPad mini in that color. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. That was yeah. A good, it reminded me of like Batman suit or something. <laughs> I don't know why, but good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Cause obviously then they went to like the aluminum stuff. So they, 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 they went away from. They did know, space gray from there. Yeah. And they had like the worst iPhone, the worst iPhone times were like when they, the iPhone six with the annoying lines on the back. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's, this are ugly today. Like the six yeah. was cool because the screens got bigger, right? And it had the, yeah. like the curved glass. But the actual just like raw look of the phones, probably like the worst one Apple's ever done. Like if you yeah, actually rank like, them, just purely an industrial design. Yeah, it's like covered in like a wrapper, and you know, like you want to peel those lines off. Yeah, they um, look like packaging materials rather than like things. When you look back on them, it doesn't look good. Yeah, and if you compare that to like whenever Steve Jobs was like owning up to the iPhone four having those four antenna lines, like. That, that was way not as bad because in the back of the sixth design, it's like webs of lines. Yeah. yeah. And they slowly, you know, with the success, they made the lines less prominent. And then, you know, they finally got rid of them by going to all yeah. glass bags. Mm -hmm. But anyway, back to the Bloomberg report. Uh, back obviously, to Bloomberg. Mark, Mark's confirming what we all know with the 5.4 inch model, the 6.7 inch big model, and the two 6.1 inch models. Uh, he says that the. There's going to be a staggered release, so the uh, the non-pro ones, so the 5.4 inch and the base model 6.1 inch, will be coming out in October, and then the pro models will follow in a few weeks after that. So maybe like the first week in November or something. October could be the whole month of iPhones. Right. Every um, every, every it, week you get a new iPhone. And in terms of what's different between the pro and non-pro, well, definitely the lidar sensor is only be on the pro ones. Uh, beyond that, you have the screen size difference on the you know on the Max, uh, but we still don't know if there's going to be anything else. The highest end one will apparently support the fastest speed 5G, which is the millimeter wave 5G. Uh, and that's going to be like the main difference. Just based on what we know so far, it feels like one of, it feels like pretty small differentiation between the, the non-pro and the, and the pro, just especially on that 6.1 inch model. Like if all the difference you're going to get is the LiDAR scanner, I guess you're going to get a third camera versus dual camera. And that's probably how they're going to frame it. But yeah, it feels like they could do with something else in the mix there for a while there were rumors of the you know promotion 120 hertz stuff but those have definitely died away sadly so it just seems like we're gonna get normal displays uh this year the other th interesting thing in mark's report is that he quotes or you know paraphrases uh discussions with apple engineers who've been using the prototypes they said uh 
They think that the new 6.7-inch screen is one of this year's most notable improvements, and the few testers found that current 5G networks are not improving the connection speeds that much. Uh, which, if your best feature is the 6.7-inch screen size, I'm not interested. Like, I don't want a phone bigger than what I've got now. Like, if you want to make a 6.1-inch phone but with smaller bezels so it fits in, like, the 5.8-inch phone, that's fine. But if if, mm -hmm. if it got any bigger than, like, the iPhone 11 size, I'm, I'm not interested. Like, I don't want the Max phone when it was 6.5 inches, and I still don't want it when it's 6.7, right? Yeah, I, I enjoy them, but, like, I don't, I, I don't enjoy them long-term. Um, yeah. They're neat to use, and when you see them, like, oh, that's really cool. And, and maybe, like, they're... I'm sure that there are, like, there's an audience that's, like, you know, you can't live without that bigger phone. Um, for me... It, I, I always go back to the smaller one and then it, it, it feels like it's just nicer that like to, to miniaturize it that way is just nicer. Um, and then I, I would even take it a little bit smaller. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, not like inch or the, the 5.4 but... inch. Yeah, for yeah. sure. They're going to be more of what, like, I think most of the tech community looks at, like, although you can't deny that the big phones are very popular in the, in the market. Right. Like mm -hmm. Definitely. for me, the big phones are like, the things that are good in theory but then practically you don't want them kind of like how it'd be nice if you could just use your iphone without it being in a case but that's just like so dangerous that you have to put it in a case right it's like I... you're gonna say you don't use a case aren't you but no i was, I was gonna ask how you were doing today <laughs> <laughs> my iphone's in a case it's always been in a case i can't mine's in mine's in a, when it, well there are times when i have to have a case so i i i, I was caseless for a long long time and then i wasn't caseless for a long long time and uh now i use the smart battery case when like i i have to have a case for mm -hmm. something you know and, and then other than that i don't and the back of the phone and the sides are perfect the front of the phone is like scratched to no end and uh you know <laughs> oh, oh well i don't know why but it's horribly scratched in the front yeah i mean when they've definitely changed the glass like makeup, the case wouldn't really help yeah, so I don't know. It's, it's I, I they've, they've made trade-offs where they've like kind of stopped it from shattering, but it's still easily. It's more now. It's more easy to scratch, basically. Definitely, yeah. Which is, yeah. I mean, I'll, when the screen's on, it's not as big of a deal. There, there are a couple in there that I can feel. Yeah, like they've made uh, it more more easy for them to have like small scratches that you don't see when the screen turns on. But I yeah. guess that's the trade-off you take versus having like a big crack down the middle of the, of the glass. And. Uh, about the thing about it being um, like the five G feature being not very impactful, like I've been saying that for months. Like the biggest reason that you know Apple wants to push five G phones out, I, I say this with mostly truth, is that the carriers want to promote five G. Like the, the the carriers want people to upgrade their devices. They they're clamoring onto this five G thing as if it's going to like change the world overnight. But if you actually look in real world use cases. Most people aren't going to even notice, I don't think. Like, apart from it saying 5G in the corner, which if you have AT&T devices, you're already set on that one. The um, uh, 5G. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's... Like, what, Only like, when I travel. The super fast 5G is... You have to be, like, right next to the towers to even notice it. The lowest end 5G, you're going to get, what, like, 80 meg down? Okay, great. That's more than the, you know, 20 meg that you probably get right now. But what you can do with that difference on the phone, like download a video slightly faster i don't know like you gotta tell me something that's of any of any value of having a 5g chip in there and having a 5g radio like use 4k on youtube on ios oh come on you know like <laughs> the f better people right i swear that's a placebo as well on on the iphone screen size can you really tell the difference between the 4k version and the low version yeah, no, and, yeah. and, and on 20, i'm pretty sure on 20 well. meg if you've got 20 megs earlier you can stream 4k anyway like it's more than yeah. enough like, one, one thing that's like horribly slow for me i don't think it's like a network thing i think it's apple servers is as i cloud photos whenever you're going to yep. like have the full image it's horribly slow even on like yeah. the best it's slow on my home broadband though as well mm -hmm. yeah same same so same if, you're, if you're on a 5g network it's not going to make iCloud photos faster no yeah, yeah, yeah. like and the lidar scan is the same deal right like i'd love to have like a survey of 2020 ipad pro owners have they used the lidar scanner once like what are you going to use it for? Can't live without it. Nothing. The only thing I think they're going for is the uh, AR stuff with the find my tags and the like device location. L but LiDAR you... will be LiDAR will be cooler on the phone than it is on the iPad, I think. Sure, but you're still going to have be a stretch to like, you know, upgrade your phone just for a LiDAR scanner. Right? No, like... but and, and I think this is a year where it's pretty clear that if you've got an 11 series phone, like you're, mm -hmm. you're set for a, for another year. Um, if you've got what 10s 10r like pretty doing pretty good if you got a 10 like you had a 10 for the for a long time um, 
I'm not yeah, sure like, what speeds are like on that, uh, but uh, but if you've got anything older than a ten, then it's it's a, an awesome upgrade. Um, maybe from a ten, it's a pretty good upgrade too. But from a ten S, ten R, eleven, especially eleven Pro, it's yeah. I think from the eleven series, there's no motivation. But we do love we do love new designs and new screen sizes, and this is a year where we have both of those things. Even if functionally there's not a big difference, and that's 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 not to you know be ignored because we I know both of us love a new design. We hate oh, sure. when the design gets stale. And yeah, it's been, yeah, I agree. You know, <laughs> It'd be interesting to see quite how different this year's design is. Like, I mean, obviously we see all the cab mockups and the on the and the dummies and stuff, and it does seem not like it's not a massive industrial design change. Like, they're flattening the sides. <laughs> like, it's not it's not like going from like an iPhone eight to an iPhone. Yeah, it'll, it'll, feel, it'll, it'll feel different in your hand and everything. Yeah, it will feel different. Like going from the five S to the six felt really different, even though mm. it was, and they had different screen sizes too, but. Yeah, like, I'm sure this phone is perfectly fine and it'll sell perfectly well, but I'm not, like, jumping at the bit for it, right? Like, it's just not a good year for year-over-year -year upgrades. It's year, for year-over-year -year upgrades. For year-over-year -year, yeah. is what we're saying. Like, if it had promotion, that'd be more enticing, but it doesn't know that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, Apple Watch stuff. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. So this, this again, comes from Bloomberg. Mark Gurman's report for Bloomberg saying that, that um, there will be two new Apple Watch models this year. A Series 6 and something that's like a Series 3S where you kind of look at the, the Series 3 um, as like the template for for this new watch and you, you know, make it faster. Um, you do something about it that makes it more modern and, and less long in the tooth. Although, I mean, the Apple Watch doesn't really age in the way that like maybe even a phone does. So the Series 3 is still pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I mean, the Series 3 processor is a fit, you know, a bit far behind. If you expect another performance upgrade yeah. this year in the Series 6. Yeah. Series, then... series 3 is only one generation behind Series 5 in terms of speed. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> yes. That is true. But you don't get, like, um, full detection or even ECG and stuff like that. So yeah. I, I think there's room for it. Like, obviously, it's not going to be as as big a difference as what we see on, like, the phone line between, like, iPhone XR and mm -hmm. iPhone XS. This, this is a formula that works with iPads. You take an existing iPad design that isn't, like, the state-of-the-art and, and put in a better chip inside, basically. Yeah, you rev it, like... Yeah. And again, we spoke, We actually spoke about this in the question answer section of a pre previous episode because it was rumoured, like, on one of these Twitter accounts and now it's been, you know, verified by and validated by the Bloomberg report. Uh, I think it makes sense. Like, you can... They've obviously been happy to keep the series 3 around last year and they don't seem to be able to do the new design you know the, the all screen or the you know the thinner bezel curved display style apple watch at a cheaper price because that's why they kept the series 3 around rather than changing out with the series 4 mm. and same with this year it seems like for them to be able to keep the lower price points because you know like right now the series 3 sells for 199 and maybe they're even going to go lower uh they have to just carry on with the old design but give it like a new chip uh you know make it compatible with the modern um like headphone stuff with you know like a modern w chip probably sure uh, yeah. bluetooth 5 uh and then like international sos callings or something that they added for series 5 which they could easily add for series 3 like all the stuff that's cheap mm -hmm. and then give it a new processor and then just carry on selling it like i think that makes sense if you see mm -hmm. if like if you get my drift i oh <sighs> You know, they keep doing new watch faces and watch OS 6 and 7 that don't go to the Series 3. I wonder if that's a concern at all. Like if they, if they, <laughs> but there's only one new watch face in watch OS 7, the Chronograph Pro. Um, I wonder if they'll do, a, if they, they market this kind of Series 3S type of thing, if they'll make new watch faces for watch OS 7 for it, um, just, just for the sake of like marketing it, you know, like this is a, a new watch face. Cause right now it's pretty limited. I think it's the, um, just the just the, the new roll faces or it's just right because the the, they've all, most of the new faces that have come out have been designed for the bigger curved screens right not the square yeah. off ones so yeah that is probably the biggest change you notice if you are using a series three is the watch face selection is just not as good yeah yeah, yeah. and maybe they could even do like a series three with an always on display at some point like maybe that's not this year but next year they could carry on with the industrial design of the old one but just have the screen stay on like i don't think that's the true. The always on part is the bit that's expensive. Like I think it's the rest of the design and the curved edges and the bigger screen. Yeah, and then series six. Is there any information more about what what to expect from it, or is it sadly no? We're still just so working far. on like blood oxygen well, sensor. Blood it? oxygen sensor. Yeah. yeah. You you had me watch the the David Blaine ascension thing where David Blaine uh, ascends mm -hmm. uh, via balloons <laughs> and then parachutes down from super high. 
and they were doing a lot of blood oxygen sensor you know readings with like the the medical ones that you get and you just like put on your finger um but it was like oh it's, it's, they're looking a lot at blood oxygen sensor in this uh <laughs> elevation test <laughs> well if you're, doing, if you're jumping out of the plane on a regular basis they are useful yes. in day-to-day -day life we'll, we'll see i'm sure there's some like heart condition or life condition <laughs> that, that'll be a will... story around it yeah. yeah you know like how ecg and has the regular heart notifications and then uh atrial fibrillation stuff i'm sure there's some kind of detection mm -hmm. that they can do passively through the blood oxygen sensor as it well it feels like so many years ago when we first reported that this was coming this year it yeah, it's, it has been a long, it has been a long time coming. It is interesting yeah. though, like when the Apple Watch first came out, there were the rumors it's going to come with like ten biometric sensors, and then it basically just shipped with the heart rate sensor. Heart rate, optical. Yeah, rate. and then you know with Series Four, they added ECG and a better gyroscope, which enabled the full detection stuff. But that's been about it. Like this is the first kind of new sensor apart from ECG. Mm, yeah. Yeah, uh, when, uh, so, when I think when we look back on the original watches, we were expecting like every single year they were going to add some crazy new sensor that would measure something else. When actually they've focused on other features and been much more timid about like expanding. Yeah, I mean they, they've added LTE. Uh, right. Well, they, they've added GPS. They've added LTE. They've added a barometer. They've added a compass. Like all the things that are in iPhones that you take for granted, they've added to the watch. And then there's some things from the watch that get thrown back to the phone. But yeah, yeah. Just yeah. in terms of like raw health sensors, I guess they've just got a lot of mileage out of heart rate sensor and accelerometer basically certainly certainly uh all right let's take another uh, sponsor break here yep we were sponsored by pillow a few months ago and i'm glad to say they are back so back, getting pillow. good night's sleep is underrated but with a little help it can be life-changing pillow is an all-in-one sleep tracking solution to help you be more aware of your sleep patterns and discover what might be affecting your sleep quality if you have an apple watch tracking your sleep is as easy as wearing it to bed Pillow will track and analyze your sleep automatically. One of Pillow's most loved features is the ability to get a detailed heart rate diagram of every sleep session. Compare your sleep quality with your weight, steps, caffeine consumption, and many other health metrics to discover how they might be affecting how you sleep. Enable the recording mode and Pillow will save the sounds that you make during sleep. From sleep talking, to sleep apnea, snoring, just random unexpected noises during the night. Use recording and you can find out what's going on. Find out why you're being disrupted. A lot of users have been surprised by the results. Pillow is, of course, very privacy-minded. All your sleep and audio data is encrypted and stored on your own device. And when it syncs to iCloud, it's using end-to-end -end encryption. Pillow doesn't have user accounts, so you can use it anonymously, and it won't send your personal data anywhere else. Naps boost your focus, creativity, and overall well-being. If you've been working from home, you can also take naps using Pillow's power nap modes. If you need an alarm, Pillow can wake you up using iPhone, Apple Watch, or iPad. If you have WatchOS 6, Pillow uses the new extended runtime APIs to minimize battery consumption on the watch. Pillow is available on the App Store for iPhone, Apple Watch, and iPad. Discover all of Pillow's features at naybox.com slash pillow. N-E-Y-B-O-X dot com slash pillow. Sleep well and stay safe. Our thanks to Pillow for sponsoring Happy Hour. All right, uh, so we've got some uh, Apple TV hardware stuff here, which is again kind of, from the Bloomberg report. Again from the Bloomberg report, yeah. And this Apple TV stuff is not like it's man. This is a long rumor cycle for, for a new Apple TV. Um, what are we talking about this week? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> since what like the beginning of the year, a nine to five Mac found like code references to an Apple TV refresh with either like an A12 or an A13 chip. There's been some talk of an A14 chip version as well. Uh, and then if like six months ago, a few people were saying that it's basically ready to go and then it's going to come out, but then it never did. And so we've just been kind of coasting and we're kind of expecting to come out this full, but not really expecting much from it because it's just going to basically be like a spec bump, May hopefully a lower price to go along with it because 179 starting price for the 4K version is very expensive. But again, pricing, we won't know until Apple announces it. Uh, what Bloomberg says is uh, to maybe minimize your hopes even more because it might not even come out this year. So the Apple TV update, uh, which will probably be a similar form factor. They're not going to go to like a stick or anything. It's still going to be a little box. Uh, might not be ready until next year. That's the direct wording from the Bloomberg report. It does say it's going to feature an upgraded remote control, 
including a feature that will allow you to locate your Apple TV remote if you lose it. So similar to like, you know, making your iPhone ping, you'll be able to go in the Find My app and make your Apple TV remote and make a noise so you can find it if it's falling down the back of the sofa. Good feature. Uh, and a lot of people want it. Like, oh, I follow a Twitter column about Apple TV stuff, and yeah. there are a lot of people adding Apple, like, I've lost my remote. How do I find it using Find My iPhone or something? Or make it support Find My iPhone. And obviously, right now, the Apple TV remote does not have a speaker in it, so it can't do that. Uh, what will probably happen with the new remote is they'll integrate the UWB chip. So it'll be almost like it had an AirTag attached to it, because we also believe that AirTags are launching this year, finally. What's, what's, what's AirTags? I haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> The UWB, you know, smart finding thing where you better have your phone yeah. and get a little balloon that points to where it is in the room. The, the tile ultra competitor. Wideband. The, yeah, ultra wideband indeed. The tile competitor thing. It seems like Apple's not only going to release the tags, they're also going to integrate the technology into maybe like the AirPod Studio over your headphones and the Apple TV remote. So you'll be able to get like a nice finding experience just by holding up your phone and seeing a little arrow that points where your remote's hidden. So that's a nice feature. Uh, I think people obviously want more than just a remote locator from a redesigned apple tv remote right and unfortunately the bloomberg report does not go into any more detail about what's going to change there i don't have huge problems with the design apple tv remote but i acknowledge that a lot of people do so they need to change something like even if they just made it slightly bigger so just slightly more room to do the gestures i think that would help yeah um my mother-in-law she's uh she's a teacher and she's quarantining right now because she has symptoms um which is unfortunate um so she's like stuck in stuck in the bedroom Pretty much and uh she got out the apple tv3 that we get to her like several 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 years ago and uh she was like using it to watch hulu and stuff and then the app like the, the remote the, the silver remote battery died in it it would only go down and she was trying to like type on a keyboard with only down being available um and the, and the phone app wasn't working very well and um and so the request was that i bring her a new battery for that remote and I, I, I just pulled a fire TV stick off of one of the TVs and brought it that. <laughs> it's like, this is going to be a much better experience, you know? And yeah, like, I love the Apple TV. Mm -hmm. the, the new, the yeah, I mean, the Apple TV 4 and 4K um, are, are, are a good product. They're, they're definitely the best. I'd call them the best in their class, but they're just very expensive. Yeah. Like, they yeah, need to get exactly. priced down. Yeah. Yeah, anytime someone's been holding up for years for an Apple TV and they're about to buy one now, it's like, you, you can't really say don't because it isn't like, you know, we're a month out from a new one, but in March, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. this is yeah. unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ma I Ma mean, unless he's still coming, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 upgrade your remote control at least give people some hope that they're going to do something more drastic, right? Although yeah. the last time remote... upgraded, the last time they upgraded the Siri remote, they put a white ring on the home button, and that was it. Yeah, do you see their their remote review that's been going around tech sites this, this past week, where it's like this big chunk, so, of, yeah, big chunk of thing so with much. a big logo right. on it? Yeah, it, what do they call it? The button remote, or the function remote, whatever it's called. Yeah, function. Right. Yeah, area grievances. Let's hear any, it. Any 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 IR remote can do the exact same thing. You can train any IR remote to control the Apple TV through the settings of the Apple TV, and I believe that function remote goes through the exact same process. You have to set it up through the settings. It's not. A collaboration with Apple is nothing fancy. It's an IR remote. Just go, if you want one, you can go to the Apple store and you can get the Apple old IR remote, like the one that came with the original Apple TV. If you want to, you can use that. Or you can just buy any universal Amazon, uh, universal remote from Amazon any, or one you've got lying around the house. Like, I, I understand people's grievances with the Siri remote, but don't go out and buy these special ones that are like made for Apple TV. They, they, they don't do anything different. They're just IR remotes. That's that. yeah. So don't don't think it's something that it isn't. Like, every time I saw every time I saw a picture of one of those on Twitter, I was like, oh, this is gonna annoy annoy Benjamin." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel the same way. I think you're silly, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, like your best and choice if you, do, if you don't like, like the Siri remote is just go and buy a universal remote, and then you can control your t your actual TV set. You can control your you know other other things in the living room and the Apple TV all from one remote with physical yeah. buttons. Yeah, we're yeah yeah. All right, MacBook. Pro or not MacBook Pro, 12 inch MacBook, the, the least pro of the bunch, but the most portable. Um, there's a rumor about it this week, but it's not like this is not from the Bloomberg report. Right. We finished and with Bloomberg now. We're finished with Bloomberg now. And and it's not from Coil, and it's not from um uh, from us. So it's it's one that we're not so sure about. Um but you know, the other half of this I think is that it makes sense that there's a 12 inch MacBook with Apple's chip inside to replace the 12-inch MacBook that went away because that would be the perfect to have, you know, an iPad class chip, 
except they're going to have you know better than iPad class chips in these machines. Um, what what's sketchy about this, and kind of what are the claims that we've seen from this? Yeah, so this came from like the China Times, and obviously Minchi Kuo uh, has been pretty up on the ARM roadmap. Uh, before Apple even said it was going to come out this year, he was saying that the the first ARM Mac would ship before the end of the year, and it would be a 13 inch MacBook Pro. So this obviously isn't a 13 inch MacBook Pro, and you know we'd always trust Quo over this random website. But there you go. But I think this makes sense, and they're probably going to do something of this form, whether it's this the end of the year or whether it's early next year or something who knows about the exact timing but basically the website said that apple's doing they're going to bring back the 12 inch macbook uh based on the a14x chip and it will get 15 to 20 hour battery life which is you know whatever better than any ipad which has 10 at most right like, and obviously the, phone. the laptops have more space to put batteries because they have two parts like so it makes sense the the battery life is very good and that's what everyone's been wanting right like they either want super good performance or they want super long battery life and this 12 inch macbook will come back with pretty decent performance running on an a14x chip like the a14 chip will outperform most of apple's current mac lineup like current macbook lineup easily and these are competing with like at least from the original 12 inch macbook uh well the you know the, the super thin form factor version uh an intel core and processor that they later classified the version as like an i3 and right. it was still basically the same thing this is the fanless macbook which is very cool because you know with the arm mac idea there's a desire that there's that there would be no fan like iPads and iPhones, but there's also a need for higher temperature thresholds to be tolerable. So then there's a need for a fan if you want to actually get performance that you can't get from an iPad or an iPhone. Right, like so. the the future ARM lineup might have this 12 inch and then like the MacBook Air being fanless, and then they have the MacBook Pro line, which run you know more performant Apple Silicon that still require fans for cooling. Right, so mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, I'd like so, I, I think this probably makes sense. And the, the they specifically said it's going to use the A14X chip. Apple did say they're making like a separate line of Apple Silicon for the it's machine. Family, yeah. Yeah, but especially for their lower end products, they they'd be fine basically just using. A14X. But would this be a thirteen hundred dollar MacBook like before? Or, and and what do they do with the keyboard? Because this is where the bad keyboard right. began. Yeah, <laughs> and there are some rumors that they're actually going to use the butterfly keyboard. Oh, boy. This. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which I think would be like suicide if they do that because everyone hates the Buffalo keyboard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like the A14X chip, it could be basically identical, but Apple would still name it and whatever they're going to brand the Apple Silicon line. They'd call it a different name even if the chip's the same. Uh, and for uh, for the entry level, like 12 inch machine, the performance profile of the A14X would be perfectly fine. So I think e Apple would be like, it's the M4 or whatever they call it, but it could just be the A14X chip under the hood. Just like how the developer transition kit runs on an A12Z, right? Like, you only need very minor adjustments to make it work in the inside the Mac. And then they'll have, like, truly different silicon that will be running in, like, the 13-inch Mapper Pro where they've pushed the performance for, you know, a laptop form factor rather than just replicating what an iPad can give you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I'll let you take this next one. Yeah, so John Prosser, he, uh, you know, he's been tweeting a lot of stuff this year, and one area where he's been very accurate is uh, release dates on the Apple Store. So he, mm -hmm. like, very yeah. impressively predicted that the iPhone SE would come out in like the third week of April, in like the first week of March. So that is a long time, uh, uh, you know, very, very, very accurate. And he did the same. He and he was the, alone in doing that too. Right? Yeah, exactly. He wasn't like corroborated or anything like that. Right, and. You know, I was doubtful, but he turned out to be completely right. So big kudos. He also did the same thing with the uh, iPad update and the MacBook update that we just had come through and the iMac update. The day of the iMac uh, hardware refresh came out, he said there's going to be an iMac update later in the day. And indeed there was like, so on release dates, I'm, you know, very I'm backing him all the way because he seems very, very accurate. He actually makes the decisions about this. <laughs> yeah, he's choosing when they're going to come out. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what's funny is he has uh, pronounced that there will be something Apple hardware new on this store on September 8th. So the coming Tuesday, there'll be something new. And the current theory is that it's going to be the aforementioned iPad Air, the Edge to Edge iPad Air. That is what people believe it's going to be. So the iPad Air update is a, could be available for sale as soon as next week, which is pretty exciting. That's cool. Yeah, well, we we could have three weeks in a row of talking about it 
from the idea to the confirmation to the availability. Yeah, and to continue process success story, in August, he said that the first, the, the week commencing September 7th, i.e. the same week as September 8th, uh, Apple will release the new iPad Air and the Apple Watch uh, hardware. Personally, I don't think the Apple Watch hardware is going to happen, and I think even if you ask Prosa, you'd be less confident about that one. But the iPad one makes sense. Like the, the Apple Watch and the iPhone are so intertwined, it makes sense for them to do them at the same time because they a lot of times people just buy both, right? Uh, the iPads are separate and they've done you know, iPads on their own plenty of times, so they could do the iPad in basically with a press release update next week and then we'll see the iPhones and the Apple Watches in like either a late September or first week of October event. Yeah, you, you don't have to have a new iPhone with a new Apple Watch. Like the, I think the only scenario where that would be a problem is if you were switching and you wanted to have the new iPhone and the newest Apple Watch, and then you'd be kind of in limbo for a few weeks, but that's pretty um, specific. Um, so they certainly could do an Apple Watch release before an iPhone release, especially when iPhones are kind of um, stalled throughout the fall. Um, but it would be different. I mean, just look past. historically, right? They've announced iPads on their own. So far, the Apple Watch has been always tied with an iPhone event. Even the first one, even when they were just teasing it, they did it on the iPhone 6 event. So if you well, look historically, event, yeah. they always put them together. Yeah. So that's that's next week. We have things to look forward to next week. Yeah, hopefully on Happy Hour next week, we'll be able to talk about the iPad Air. It's gone, it's gone from sketchy rumor to pretty accurate from Bloomberg to maybe released within the space of a fortnight, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> yes. And uh, this is something we, we were going to mention last week and we kind of ran out of time, but Apple TV Plus and augmented reality. Um, so uh, c- kind of, you know, one of the, f- the first um, uses of AR that's kind of neat from <laughs> Apple that's not, you know, for furniture, for Ikea, placing and stuff like that, um, where it's first party, it's Apple services, uh, and, and they're using AR in a way that, that they think makes sense. So what is, what is Apple TV Plus? AR. Yeah, so again, Mark Goomer at Bloomberg. We had a lot of Mark Goomer stories uh, this week. Always, you know, he, we used to work with him. He's great. It's that time of the year. Yeah, uh, Goomer said that Apple is developing bonus content features for the TV app, uh, which will include like augmented reality experiences for its original shows. Uh, he gave the example of if you were watching For Mankind, you could then go and get like a model of the rocket shown in your living room, maybe perched on the living room table and see it like fly away uh and you're completely right that like apple keeps talking about like how ar is the future and there's been you know the ongoing rumblings they work on this headset but if you just look brass taxed brass tax what is new from like what can you do with an all-moment reality experience on an apple device today first party from apple there's basically nothing like they would say the measure app but you know it's not really ar right like and, and they might good. even say they might even say emojis, but again, it's not really an AR feature. Even though it's using AR kit, it's not really an AR experience. Like the proper things that you think of as, you know, immersive augmented reality experiences, all come from. I, 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 had, a, I had a cool AR experience where there's this NASA book that's like blank pages, but the first mm-hmm. few pages you have an app, and it's not an AR kit at all. Yeah. But you aim the app at the book, and um, this like picture show, like a real place through. And um, I'd say maybe it's like every page is like that, but it's really neat. Um, I, I tweeted a link to it a while ago and like it didn't get that much interest, but I thought like, I, I guess like the experience, like the wow factor is in holding the phone and seeing it, but it's neat, um, but it's very specific and it's it's not AR kit. Yeah, like, so this would be basically the first AR experience coming directly from Apple. I guess they, right. might, yeah. I guess they might release the AR thing for the... Uh, air tags before right like you, you, but even that's like um you, you could use that entirely without that feature kind of pokemon go style right. or like yeah. you know use a map with this stuff like it's probably an you know a, a, there's not a non-ar equivalent maybe otherwise it's just, just like video a, yeah just like a bonus feature video segment like right this could be really cool or it could just be it like could be gimmicky. it could be gimmicky like 3d <laughs> yeah exactly like the the apple news plus uh app uh, was like introduced with the live covers and stuff. He loved showing that off on the stage, like in March 2019, and that was basically inconsequential, right? Like it could be like that, or it could be something pretty interesting. Like I think if you could like get a 3D representation of like a set, like if the the morning show set, or like 
the full mankind um like inside the spacecraft like the command terminal if you could load that up on your phone like move it around and see what was going on i think that'd be really cool uh so hopefully they're going to do stuff like that uh german says this was originally destined to come out this year but uh production issues have pushed it back as well as software issues obviously any update to the tv app uh, pricks my ears up because i'm hoping for even bigger changes and if they're working on this maybe they're working on other stuff so that's the other reason i'm happy about this because at least they're giving it attention yeah and like and 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 when i when I, when we posted this uh i got some like snarky responses that were like you know why are they doing this why aren't they prioritizing you know better recommendations a proper tab and stuff and like i get it but that's never how apple's going to work they're going to address customer feedback and do follow their own roadmaps if they want to do this and they think it's cool they're going to do it i mean uh, you're showing the person to complain about what they're not doing in the tv yeah, space like if they work on the TV app, I'm happy because it means they work on the TV app, right? They have resources to do it. So even if it takes like, you know, even if this comes out first, but then it still shows that they're, they they are investing in that area. The same with the news app, right? Like the, when Apple News Plus first came out, I was pretty critical of the experience and it was pretty bad. But they showed pretty uh, about every other month, they wrote out a decent change that actually made the News Plus experience better. So far with the TV app, uh, they haven't done anything. So that's why I'm still like so persistent about it because at least with News Plus, I, I, like, you see they recognize the mistake and they've actually changed stuff. TV app at the moment is in the limbo where you just kind of have to cross your fingers and hope that it's getting better uh, and then complain until it does. So at least the fact that they are working on you know, more sophisticated stuff for the TV app experience, it shows that they're investing in it. And so if this comes out with a bigger TV app overhaul, I'll be thrilled. So um, I'm looking forward to it. Even Even as the feature on its own, I think it could be cool for like some bonus content stuff and i wish they would do more bonus kind of stuff for tv plus to be honest like they have a few different like little like featurettes but i like seeing behind the scenes i like bloopers and so far they haven't done any of that so and a kind of ar experience is very like premium brand on the, on the nose of the kind of like apple tv plus is a podcast ar vision i guess it has to be 3d <laughs> Imagine they do. Actually, that was the other thing I thought. What if they did like AR director's commentary? So they got those kind of like 360 degree cameras and they could like record a scene being filmed and you could watch it back and see it in real time. You could see everyone in the studio. Like, they, they there are some opportunities to like make something that's meaningful here and not just be like a dumb gimmick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you want to do some questions? Yeah, let's do some questions. Let's, let's do. I, I will say the, the, the documentary stuff that they've shown this week, the motorcycle stuff has me excited. Yeah, long way up. That comes out on September yeah. 18th. So. They're doing uh, electric bikes yep. and electric trucks. Yeah, the and... trucks are the support vehicles. So right, the, right. It's, it's centered around the motorcycle bike. And apparently they're going to go f like across South America just by charging at people's houses. So that'd be Yeah, cool. there were some comments on it. Like, there were some, some quotes that are like, there's some places you just can't charge. There's not infrastructure. And so you have to rely on the kindness of people knocking on their doors and, and asking if you can charge there. And some say no, and some say yes. I would, yeah. I would try that, but. <laughs> and I will say, in, just on terms of like Apple's original content slate, like they have 10 things announced so far and there'll be more stuff coming out for the end of the year. So it's slowly ramping up even in the face of the COVID stuff. And once COVID production, once the production problems ease, they have a lot of stuff signed off on that's going to come out, you know, across 2021. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's do some Q&A stuff. Uh, Jonah says, I don't like all the apps that require subscriptions. If every app I use has this model rather than one-time payment, it becomes expensive. I completely sympathize. Clearly, we are in a time of everything turning into some kind of subscription. Uh, and you can't afford it all. You can't pay for it all. There's just If you took every single app that you used to have on your iPhone and then you start paying the subscription for every single one of them, it's just untenable. And I'm saying that as a developer who does actually have a subscription app of their own. Uh, but that's kind of the problem with the old model is that it just became unsustainable. Like for the developers to continue creating the applications and developing and maintaining them, the ongoing costs ramped up. And in the absence of like upgrade pricing or some alternative ideas, uh, advertising wasn't cutting it. The subscription model is the most effective way to do it. And so as a customer, you basically have to pick and choose more selectively the apps that you want to support and then look for free alternatives or paid alternatives or simpler alternatives for other stuff. And Unfortunately, I don't see any reversal of that situation. You're not going to see like um if if everyone stopped buying subscription apps, you're not going to see people go back. You're just going to see people like slim down or trim what they pay for to like three or four applications or three or four services. Kind of like with um 
uh, TV, right? Like, there are so many streaming services you can subscribe to. Uh, but, you know, basically no one's going to subscribe to all of them. You're just going to subscribe to, you know, one, two or three that you want to. And that doesn't mean the, the other ones are going to fade into irrelevance and disappear. Like, they'll just carry on and serve their niches and they'll have other people serving their audiences too. And as long as Apple has the monetary benefits of the fact that after the first year, their commission gets halved, like... They're incentivizing developers to adopt subscriptions for exactly that reason. Because if you can retain a customer for a year, you're basically making twice as much money than if you sold them, you know, version one of the app in the first year and version two of the app in the second year. So, like, we, you know, we're way down the rabbit hole there. And unfortunately, it's never going to change. You just have to kind of pick and choose your four or five favorite apps that you want to support and then let everything else fall by the wayside. Yeah. Another question is, could, could we see... Um instead of press releases like just press releases to have promo videos like the, the for new products like we had for um the magic keyboard for the ipad uh first i had to think about that like when did they do a video for a magic keyboard for the mac it's been a long time since they had a new update there but it's just the <laughs> standard version that they they went video mode on um and and uh you know sure but that also made me think about just you know what will the fall events look like? Um, will the, will there be one fall event? I I guess so, you know. But if they have, if they do, um, you know, new products here and there, um, and and not have a central event, that would be interesting. I mean, I it think it will be... probably be like what we saw last year, except the fact that the iPhone event is going to be virtual, right? They're not going to have people come to a location. It's going to be filmed and pre-recorded, just like WWDC. That's... Yeah, but, it's gonna be, but last it's gonna year be they did the because... iPhone event with the watches, and then in October time they had the 16-inch MacBook Pro, and they had the AirPods Pro come out just in like press releases and videos. That's so true. Yeah. I think they're probably going to do that again, and next week we'll have press releases for fingers crossed the iPad Air. Then they'll follow up with an iPhone event, maybe having like uh, the watches with it, and then maybe like Air Tags or AirPods Studio, and then before the end of the year they'll have like the. Uh, apple silicon mac unveiling and ship that as well and that'll probably have like videos and stuff because it's you know significant they'll probably they might tease out the iphone event actually to be like and we have our first apple silicon mac shipping next month or something just because it's such a big event for them uh mm -hmm. like a big deal like the, this transition uh but stuff like air tags could just come out in october with like press releases and stuff like i think they showed last year they're more than happy to have a single event but even if they've got spillover of products they'll just do you know little mini press releases across october and november for them mm -hmm. yeah um, will, and then, will you buy Airport Studio? That's another question. Yeah, I, I like I like the angle on that where we when we did the HomePod Ruby episode where it was like HomePod is this brand new thing and we spent in a whole episode talking about just HomePod. Um, and that was and that, that was in the climate, by the way, where most of the tech podcasts were just like laughing that HomePod is like a complete flop of a product. And fast forward a year, all those tech podcasts were like, we've got four of them, we love them. So I'll just say we we were right from the beginning there. Talk, talk about anybody who's specific. Um, <laughs> for 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 the 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 AirPod Studio, I don't I don't know. Like I'm not I'm not. It's it's not so different that it's um, you know what like like AirPods. The first AirPods were so different that it's like, like we did an, Air, an AirPods episode, didn't we? Um, mm. I'm not sure that we did one for pros. No, we didn't do one for pros. We did one for the AirPods. AirPods. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not sure I'd feel that that way about an AirPods Studio uh i'll 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 use them oh yeah you're gonna get them right well it depends on the cost if they're like well, 400 bucks then probably not it's not a priority true. Uh, do you have over headphones at the moment yeah yeah what do you have at the moment beat uh studios? i i sold beat studio because okay. there's they're, they're certainly on the way out um beat solo pro which my my daughter uses them mostly, but there there's a missing AirPods charging case, so they, they became useful in the last week or so, and they're really good. Like you know, the w once you get over the the fit of them compared to Studio, that you know the Studios are larger. Um, the the Solo Pros with transparency and with cancellation, they're really really good. Yeah, uh, I think I think that the 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 folding folding it to turn it off is an awkward thing. I don't like that because. I don't fold them otherwise, and it's just to turn them off now. Yeah, um, and we can almost guarantee that the AirPods Studio are going to have just little sensors in the ear cups that will know when you take them off, so you won't have to worry about that. Yeah, it's just, I, I think, right, I mean, it, it just varies, it's kind of depending on what's going on in my life, but right now, um, on-ear or over-ear headphones are kind of secondary to just having a, a 
pair of AirPods that I haven't lost in a part two. Yeah, based on AirPods, yeah. they're very good. Like, yeah. I, I, I'm down for the AirPods Studio. I can't use these are my only overhead headphones that I have, and they mm. are wireless, but they charge with like mini USB, so I never charge them. I just always plug them in. Uh, yeah. And these are like five years old now, and the ear cups are starting to get a bit dry. So I kind and of when, when, when I'm not missing, you know, half my recording equipment in a different state, then um, I, I use just any kind of, you know, earbud or in ear earphone is my preference, you know, for, for listening to the audio from the podcast as we talk, yeah. um, have that live feedback. Um, it's it's kind of like never preferred for me to have cups over my ears and, that, and just lately, I don't know. I mean, it, yeah, it's like not, it changes, but not right now. It's different. It's different opinions of different people, obviously. Like I, I love my original AirPods, but I'm not keen on AirPod Pros. Like I just don't. I, like I will how... say, like if, if you have like serious headphones, I mean, and, and you love listening to music, it sounds way better. But yeah. then also, um, I like to have like open music where I'm not having it uh, on my head instead right. of this HomePod or yeah. you know my car stereo, like going for a drive and listening. That's like the best version of listening to, to something. You know, like, yeah, like if I'm if I'm in my office, I just pick the uh, I just pick the home to play music the majority of the time. Yeah, come here. My, my son Rory just woke up from his nap, perfectly timed. That's probably a good time to end the show. I I, I think it's a wonderful time to end the show. <laughs> There's also a neighborhood of kids here. It turns out. So hey. Hi. <laughs> and, and Emily, my daughter Emily. So. All right. This, this is my friend. This is something that we could never, <laughs> that we never had to deal with when we didn't do live YouTube episodes. <laughs> but, uh, they just, it, it, it certainly happened. We just edited it out. <laughs> All right. That is the half hour podcast for this week. If you, I will get you a drink. That is the half hour podcast for this week. We will be back next week with a new episode. Bye, everybody. 2020, boys. <laughs>